In the next few PowerPoints, we're going to examine energy relationships and chemical changes. This is the last quantitative component of chemical changes that we'll examine this semester, and it's a very important one. All changes, whether they be chemical or physical, involve energy. Some absorb energy, like the process of photosynthesis or boiling water. Others release energy, like combustion processes. The amount of energy absorbed or released in these processes is important to quantify. And in this PowerPoint, we're going to look at the basics of energy and its quantification, particularly in the form of heat. The formal definition of energy is the capacity to supply heat or to do work. And we usually talk about energy in two different forms, potential energy and kinetic energy. Potential energy is the energy an object possesses based on its position or its composition. So consider the water at the top of a waterfall or a dam. It possesses greater potential energy than the water at the bottom simply because it is at a higher elevation. As it falls, the potential energy based on its position is transformed into kinetic energy or energy of motion. In hydroelectric power, that energy is used to do work, to turn turbines, and to generate electricity. The concepts of potential and kinetic energy apply to chemical reactions as well. Energy is stored in chemical bonds. The amount of energy is defined by the types of atoms bound together and their relative position to each other. Energy is also found stored in the nucleus of the atom. The amount of energy is determined by the relationship of protons and neutrons and their position relative to each other. We change the position of either atoms in a chemical bond or protons and neutrons in a nucleus, and we can transform that potential energy into kinetic energy. One of the most common forms of kinetic energy that we find in chemistry is thermal energy, which is associated with the movement of molecules. Energy can also be transformed into expanding gases, which apply pressure and exert a force that can move objects, which is a form of work. It can also be associated with electrical energy, moving electrons, or light energy, which is the movement of electromagnetic fields. All of these involve movement and are considered kinetic energy. We can also talk about chemical reactions as endothermic or exothermic. So an endothermic chemical reaction is one in which energy is absorbed, such as the formation of simple sugars through the process of photosynthesis. Light energy is actually stored within the chemical bonds of gl the glucose molecules that are formed. That energy in chemical bonds can be released in exothermic processes. So a great example of an exothermic process is combustion, in which a hydrocarbon fuel is reacted with oxygen to form carbon dioxide and water and to release heat and light. Now let's examine thermal energy in more depth because this is the form of energy that is easiest for us to measure. Thermal energy is the kinetic energy associated with the random motion of atoms and molecules. And the particles that make up all matter are in constant random motion, even those in solids and liquids. They're not moving as much or as quickly as molecules in gas, but they are in motion and how much they move is dependent on the temperature of the substance. The higher the temperature, the greater the motion. So imagine water molecules in both cold and hot water. The water molecules are vibrating, but if you increase the temperature, the water molecules increase their energy and their motion. Temperature, as we've discussed before, is simply a measure of the average kinetic energy or energy of motion of the particles in a substance. Heat is the transfer of thermal energy from an object or substance with a higher temperature to that of a lower temperature. It happens through contact between the two substances. 
and particles with higher temperature kinetic energy will transfer over some of their thermal energy to the particles at lower temperature kinetic energy until they reach thermal equilibrium. At this point, the two substances have the same temperature, which is somewhere in between the original temperatures of the two separate substances. So because the transfer of thermal energy or heat involves a change in temperature, we can easily measure the change. And we can use the temperature change to quantify the amount of energy transferred. Heat transfer is quantified using the heat capacity formula, where Q is the variable that we use to represent heat. It's the heat energy transferred into or out of a substance, and it's measured in units of joules, which is abbreviated with the capital J. M represents the mass of the substance that changes temperature, and it's measured in units of grams. C is a constant that is specific to the identity of the substance that's changing temperature. It's known as the specific heat capacity of the substance, and it's usually measured in units of joules per gram degree Celsius. And finally, our delta T, that uh, triangle is actually the Greek letter delta, that delta T stands for change in the temperature of the substance. It's usually measured in units of degree Celsius. And it always represents the final temperature of the substance minus the initial temperature. So let's talk a little bit more about heat capacity. This is a constant reference value that's determined by the composition of the substance and the state of the substance, whether it's a solid, a liquid, or a gas. Now you know that metal pots and pans can heat rapidly on your stovetop. And this means that it doesn't take a lot of energy input before the temperature of the metal starts to rise. They have a lower heat capacity. For example, if you're using aluminum pans, they take 0 0.897 joules for every gram of aluminum to raise the temperature 1 degree Celsius. You also know that the water inside the cooking pot generally heats up much more slowly. And that's because water has a higher heat capacity. So liquid water, one gram of it, requires 4.184 joules to raise the temperature one degree Celsius. This is significantly higher than what we see for the metal. So these sp specific heat capacities are reference values that are specific to the type of substance and can usually be found in reference tables, like this one, which is excerpted from Table 5.1 of your textbook. It should be noted that specific heat is dependent upon the phase of the substance. So liquid water and solid water, which is ice, have two different heat capacities. It's also somewhat dependent on temperature and for gases on pressure. That dependence is pretty small though, so that we tend to treat specific heat capacity as a constant over the normal range of temperatures and pressures that we experience on an everyday basis. How quickly something heats up also depends on the amount of substance that you're trying to heat up. So say you're gonna heat a large frying pan and a small frying pan, both made out of cast iron. They're made of the same substance, so they have the same specific heat capacity. However, the smaller frying pan has a much smaller mass. So for the same amount of heat tra transfer, it will experience a larger temperature change than the larger frying pan. In other words, the larger frying pan will take longer because more heat has to be transferred to heat up all of that cast iron. So let's apply the heat capacity formula to this situation. How much heat in joules must be added to a 500 gram iron skillet to increase its temperature from 25 degrees Celsius to 250 degrees Celsius? Knowing that the specific heat of the iron is 0 0.451 joules per gram degree Celsius. We'll use the heat capacity formula. Q equals M times C times delta T. Let's 
identify all of our variables. So we're solving for Q, which is heat. Our mass of the skillet is 500 grams, or 5.00 times 10 to the second in scientific notation. Specific heat of the iron is 0.451 joules per gram degree Celsius. And delta T is the difference between our final and initial temperatures. So we start at 25 degrees Celsius. So this is our initial temperature. And then we add heat to this skillet. So we heat it up to our final temperature of 250 degrees. So delta T is going to be equal to 250 minus 25, which gives us a change in temperature of plus 225 degrees Celsius. If our skillet had been cooling down, our final temp temperature would be lower than our initial temperature, and we would end up with a delta T that is negative. So by convention, our heat transfer is always positive when you're absorbing heat energy. And your heat transfer is always negative when you're releasing energy. And this is uh, mirrored in our delta T values. Your delta T is always positive when you are absorbing heat, whereas your delta T is always negative when you are losing heat or cooling down. So now we can add all of these values into our heat capacity formula, and we can solve for joules. So notice that our units cancel out with the units in the specific heat capacity, grams and degrees Celsius, and it's going to leave us with units of joules. And Q is equal to 50,738 joules. We actually want to round this ultimately to three significant figures, which is the same number of significant figures we have in all of our measurements. So the easiest way to do this is actually to convert this into kilojoules because it's such a large number. So we can uh, move the decimal over three places or divide by 1,000, and we get 50.7 kilojoules with three significant figures. In summary, energy is the capacity to supply heat or do work. And in chemistry, potential energy is associated with the energy stored in chemical bonds in the nucleus of atoms. Kinetic energy is associated with thermal energy, the expansion of gases, electrical energy, and light energy. Endothermic processes absorb energy, while exothermic processes release energy. And we can quantify the transfer of thermal energy, or heat, using the heat capacity formula. Q equals M times C times delta T.